we're going to talk about doing development inside of containers. So it's kind of nice that we left the slide up here uh, to kind of kick things off. Um, so you said your spiel, so I need to save time for you at the end of right. this, right? All right. So, but I'll make sure we get to the top of the hour so that Nick can get up and give his presentation, which is I'm looking forward to as well. Um, so as Bill mentioned, I work at Microsoft. I'm a technical architect here in the Philadelphia MTC, which is the Microsoft Technology Center. Uh, I've been here for about seven years, coming up on seven years. And most of the conversations I have revolve around Azure and app innovation. So building for Azure, developer tooling, DevOps, all of those great kind of subjects. This topic um, came out from, uh, uh, actually, it's kind of funny. It's a conversation I had with a couple of different customers recently uh, around how to change uh, from doing development locally on your machine to doing development inside of a container. And the idea is that we get around some of the, the uh, updating and uh, having certain things be installed on your machine versus not. Um, it also kind of, I jumped at the chance to talk about this because when we did the dev code or dev zone uh, movie thing back in May, Bill asked the question of everyone, how many people have code spaces? Because it was one of the things that we presented there. Um, and there weren't a lot of hands that went up. And I thought, well, that was kind of interesting because that's a, a pretty cool topic. Um, also, the, we didn't really have code spaces GA yet at that point. But so there was that balance. So I thought it would be good to come back and lead into um, lead into the session tonight and, and talk about how you can do developments in containers, code spaces just being one of those places where those containers can eventually run, okay? Um, before I forget, because Andy will kill me if I don't, just a bit of rest of introduction. Um, been doing speaking in the community here for probably since about uh, 2011. Uh, doing sessions like this, I started with 15 minutes of fame, and this is what ends up happening once you go through and do that. So please, it's jump at the opportunity because it's really awesome. Um, in addition to that, uh, it gives me the opportunity to speak at a number of different places. But I also do a local um, do do essentially a live stream with a couple of friends of mine called the Dev Talk Show. And um, I don't have, I didn't put a link up there for that. But if you go to youtube.com slash the Dev Talk Show, uh, every night, Wednesday night, 8.30, we do a show. And fortunately, Nick has agreed to be the special guest for tonight. So we're going to go, after this is done, go downstairs to the studio and, and do a bit of a session there. So feel free to uh, check that out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It takes a half hour to get down there and then, right. so if you can get home, um, Otherwise, Wednesday is at 8.30. Yes. Oh, cool. Uh, let's Chris do this. Chris is, yes. He's, he, yes, he does. Mm, let's see. Uh, all right, let me ask you all. How many people do containers on a, on a daily basis? So we've got a few. Okay. I'm going to do, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I'm just going to do a little bit of background around containers and why they're important and why this is kind of a good idea to think about that from a development perspective. So let me just jump into this. So for those, I know, you know, kind of balance it more on the side, but for those who haven't done anything with containers yet, um, the idea of a container is that you have, um, lack of being redundant, uh, essentially a, a collection or um, a box or you know, some kind of a, a, a sandbox area that essentially provides isolation um, and a package of it of code, any kind of frameworks, any kind of uh, um, uh, tool sets that you might want to include inside of there. Those can all essentially be put in that one uh, in that one box, let's say, because I keep wanting to use container and that's not the right, you know, they shouldn't over be doing that. Uh, but the idea is that you get a lot of reliability by, by having everything packaged inside of there. It's defined via code, and we'll see in a little bit what that code looks like, that uh, it can be essentially stored as a, uh, in what's called a, a registry so that others can then go ahead and pull that down and use that same image that instantiates a container. So containers where everything runs and a running version of that is called a container. There is a gold image of it or a master of that 
And typically that's called an image, and that is what you store and let other people bring down. We'll see that as we go through some of the things we're doing here tonight. Um, there is, containers come in two flavors. They come in a Windows flavor or a Linux flavor. Most often than not, you're going to do a container in a Linux flavor, just because that seems to be where a lot of the tooling is, a lot of the experience is, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the usefulness of them comes from that. There is the capability, if you have an application that needs to run inside of a Windows container, you can certainly do that. But for most of the applications and frameworks that we're doing, having a Linux container is really where things are at this point. Feel free to stop me, make this interactive, ask me questions. I'd rather, we're all here live, but I'd rather have you guys ask questions than uh, uh, read, a few, read through a few slides there. But. The important thing around containers is when we get to this line in that it was a build. Yes. We get past the important <clears throat> first object there that works on my machine, right? We always get the thing, I've got code, I got right, hey, deploy, uh, it builds and compiles here, no problem. We get around that. Uh, we also get around, uh, or we, we get the benefit of every environment essentially looks the same. So if we got a dev environment, a test environment, a prod environment, I can take that container and run it in all of those environments. I can make it a little bit unique by injecting environment variables inside of that when I instantiate that container. But in essence, that code is going to run the same in all of those locations. Um, Increased velocity. This is uh, kind of a big deal, especially when we think about um, being able to spin up those containers if something should make them crash or, or uh, make them stop working. A container can essentially spin up in a matter of seconds, comparing that to what we might have done in a virtual machine where that by the time the operating system spins up and all the frameworks load and all of those things, you're talking several minutes. And they quite literally can run anywhere. Um, Oftentimes, I know in Azure, we've got at least a half dozen different ways that we can run containers. Uh, other cloud vendors have different ways that are different mechanisms for making containers run. You can run containers on premises. You can run them in your notebook. You can pretty much, if you can put it in a container, there's going to be a place somewhere for you to make it land and run. We talked a little bit around, whoops, sorry, I'm not. There we go. Okay. So we talked about that there's a definite file that makes that container, uh, or yeah, that container essentially run. And that's what this is. This is called the Docker file. And there are some important components to it. When we look at the, um, the first line up there, that from is we talked a little bit about what an image is. So this is the base image that we're going to pull down to make our code run. Um, from that, we define, uh, in this case, we're defining an environment variable letting the code engine know that this is going to be a development environment, and we can have a n number of environment variables inside of there. We can tell it where we want to start from a working directory perspective, and that's what that slash app is. Uh, we're going to say, wherever this Docker file is running, we're going to basically say, copy all of the code, all of the code, that's, that's what the dot, first dot means, and drop it into where our working directory is, and that's what that second dot means. So if we wanted to find <laughs> A different directory where our code lives or a different directory where we want to deploy it, that's where we would do that. And then once it gets going, what do you want it to do? We want it to run and run that .NET restore command. Um, and then the bottom line there is essentially, how would I go ahead and call this file and make it run? So in this case, we're saying Docker build, um, and we're using that code, that Docker file to essentially build out and create an image. Questions? Since we talked about image, I'll do one more slide, and then we'll get into looking at something a little different. Everything we created there by creating that base image uh, that took, if you think about the Docker file, it took an image and put our code inside of it, and now it gives us the chance to create an image. We need some place to basically store that, and that's what a container registry is. So we can say this, we've created it, it works, it works well for us, we're going to go ahead and move that up into a container registry, and now it's available for anybody else who wants to bring it down and use it for their purposes. There are a number of different container registries that are out there. A popular one is Docker, right? Everybody's probably heard of Docker Hub, if you've done any kind of container work. Uh, there are also... Um, 
You can also put container, I'm sorry, you can also create images and put them in GitHub as well. GitHub now has their own container registry. Uh, you can create a container registry for your organization through Azure because there's an Azure container registry. So it's just a matter of whether you want to have those, you have, you know, Images you want to keep uh, secure inside of your environment, so you might use an Azure one, or if you're just sharing them out there with others, you might go ahead and put it inside of GitHub. All right. Any questions around that? So we've got images. We use those images to create containers. We have uh, essentially those images and containers are created based off of files, so they're able to be repeatable. And those are some of the basic concepts I think we can kind of get away with uh, and being able to uh, um, start going down the dev container path. So let's do this. All right. Uh, I don't think we have. So this is Visual Studio Code. How many are you using Visual Studio Code? Try. <laughs> there is no, there is no, what is the saying, right? I've been programming for 40 years. I've tried. Like, right. You never get good at it. You just try. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Um, I definitely recommend going out and trying it. It is a lightweight editor. It works on Windows, Mac, Linux. doesn't matter where. It actually works in the web. Because if we go to... Um, let's see if I can bring this up here quickly. What does it cost? It is free. Really? No way. <laughs> so we go ahead and do. So we do this here, Visual Studio Code dot, or VS Code dot dev. We essentially have a version of it running in a browser. So you don't even have to install it to get it up and running and start using it. But in this case, I do have an installation. And what I'm going to do is, uh, let's do this. So I'm just bringing up a command line here. I'm going to create a new application. Let's see, uh, let's make a directory dev .net. Oh, it already exists, okay. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new .NET application. I'm going to keep it really simple and just, uh, that's what I want to do, list, sorry. So these are, when we do .NET new application, these are all the different types of applications that we can create easily inside of our uh, uh, Visual Studio code. Um, let's see, what we're going to do is grab a, um, I know it's called web app. I'm just trying to see where. Uh, it's web. Uh, okay. I thought there was one called web app. That was what I was looking for as well. Thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. Dot net new um, type will be web. And we're going to go ahead and give it a name. And we're going to call it uh, demo. This is going to do is it's going to create an empty web application for us. It's put it in a folder uh, appropriately titled based on naming. And if I look at it, this is all of the, essentially the contents of this folder. I can go ahead and now launch a Visual Studio instance of this. And all of this is still running on my machine. I've set this up to kind of get, um, get to the point of we have a project. We have it running inside of Visual Studio Code. And I can, if we want to, we can go ahead and also, you know, kick it off, debug it. And it should be a very simple hello world-ish kind of web application. That's interesting. That's fine. I know. Uh, I don't need to. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there we 
we go. It's going to execute. It's going to build. Zoom out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So nice, simple hello. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Point there is that we have an application that's running, which is good. So what we want to do, though, is this application is running on my machine. I needed to have a version of .NET uh, Core SDK. I needed to have, you know, instance of Visual Studio Code on my machine which will probably still need that anyway, but um, the idea here is, I'm going to bring that back down because it's tough for me to look at all of those. You were heckling, weren't you? <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Uh, all right. You did, and I, I forgot you had asked. Um, let's see. So essentially just a really quick application that's running. What I'm going to do, though, is... Um, Visual Studio Code, one of the great things about it is that it has what are called extensions. And extensions give you the ability to uh, add additional capabilities inside of this editor. And that's when you have a lightweight editor like this, oftentimes a lot of the features and functionalities and things that you want come from these extensible plugins. Uh, so what we're going to do here is, and remote, Look for a plugin called Remote Containers. And if you're following along, this is what you can do at home. Um, this is, is actually a really powerful extension uh, for Visual Studio Code because it provides not one, not two, but three other extensions inside of it. So you get three for one inside of this. But what it does is it gives you the ability to um, contain, uh, to, I'm sorry, try that one, Remote Development. That's the one that has all three of them in it. And it says so up here at the front with the extension pack. So remote development gives you all three of those. It gives you remote containers, and we'll see what that does in a second. It gives you remote SSH, which lets you essentially create a uh, remote connection over SSH to a Linux machine inside of Visual Code or Visual VS Code. Yeah. And then you can also do a connection to WSL. So if you're running the Windows subsystem for Linux on your machine or on another machine that you can connect to, you can connect to that with this extension as well. What we're focusing on, though, is the functionality that is inside of remote containers, because we're going to take that project that we just did and have VS Code and that extension create a container for us. Uh, so I'm going to stop the bugging. Let's disconnect. Okay. And I'm going to do the Control-Shift-P. And what I want to do is um, do what is called uh, add development container configuration files. And it's going to look to do that for our project here. Um, speaking of our project, before we do that. So this, take a look here now. This is all we have from a project perspective, right? I got a VS code, I got a bin, an object, some properties, nothing else inside of here at this point. So if I do my containers and I say add, it's going to walk me through some of the steps I need to create this container. The first thing it's going to ask me is, well, what language am I using? Because it wasn't, kind of thinks it's C-sharp, but it could be something different. In this case, we're going to say, yep, it's a C-sharp project. I can define what version of C-sharp I want to do, Bullseye being the, the default, because it's the latest. So I'm going to grab that. There is a version of Node that gets included inside of here um, when we do this. So we're just going to go ahead and click the default. This section here talks about features and there's addition think about what we're doing we're actually taking our code and putting it inside of a container and if we're accessing it inside of a container we're probably not going to be able to get to anything that's on the on the local machine or the host machine quite easily without having to maybe pop out of that container and do some commands that way in this case we can actually bring in things that we feel might be important. So if this is an Azure project, I can bring in the Azure CLI. If I know I'm going to want to connect to GitHub, I can bring in the GitHub CLI. There are many of these features that are out there. And we'll talk about features a little more before the end because there are some recent enhancements around, around that aspect of it. I'm not going to add anything to it because it, this is a demo and it takes the time to put those in, quite honestly. Um, but you see what immediately happened there with Visual Studio is that it came back and said, hey, I now see this file inside of here called devcontainer.json. And because I see this, 
that gives you, yeah, I have some options. And what this is, this dev container dot JSON. Oh, sorry. Oh, leave that guy. Da -da. If you go out to containers, uh, sorry. Containers.dev, this is where all the information about that dev container file exists. It is an evolving specification, open specification that uh, um, defines how you can deal with containers um, and, and do development inside of them. And if your application is aware of how to handle exposing containers um, through its uh, through its interface, then this is gives it the the foot or the uh, the blueprint how to uh, to process all of that. So there is a, a specification out there that is our, our JSON document, and we'll show a real one in a second. Um, and then there is a number of uh, uh, tooling and information around this as well. So this dev container JSON typically resides in in one of these areas. That's where it looks for it first. If it doesn't see it, then um, you may have to point towards where that exists. We can start with either it, um, it can start from an image, or it can actually start from a Docker file itself, or you can use it as part of a Docker compose command for those who are aware of all of the uh, container options. There are additional options inside of here as well when it comes to features, and I'll show that in a second. You can include your environment variables inside of here. Um, you can include uh, uh, a, um, a disk mount so that you know uh, where files are, are um, so you can bring in files inside of the container. And you can define who the user is, and then there's a definite life cycle around how this container gets spun up once you say, go ahead and reload this in a container. So the specification defines all of those aspects of the dev container uh, capabilities. If I go back to our Visual Studio code, and I say, let's go ahead and reopen this in a container. So it is a separate instance of Visual Studio that is up and running. And you see we've got our little folder here for demo tonight. We're waiting for it to go ahead and process and we'll see if we actually open this, we can see what's happening. So it is actually, there we go. It looks like it's almost finished. Sorry? Yes. Um, so it's downloaded. Um, some of the extensions that are needed when it comes to C-sharp because we said at the beginning, yes, let's go ahead and add C-sharp. Um, it's installed. It's okay. All right. So in, I believe that is everything. Okay. So what happened though here is you see we have an additional folder. So this dev container folder actually has two new files inside of there. There is a dev container.json, and we'll bring that up and see what that looks like. Let me close this off. And we'll see here that we've got essentially, you know, some of the common stuff. We have a name. Uh, in here, we have a build section. And if you remember from what we're looking at the documentation just a few seconds ago, we have an option to bring in an image, but in this case, we're bringing in the actual Docker file itself. Well, where did it get that Docker file from? right alongside of it, actually created it at the same time based on the information I put in there. So here's the variant of the, uh, of the code that we're at the, of the uh, image that we're using. So we said we were going to use C-sharp and we're going to use uh, uh, .NET's uh, version 6. Uh, so that is essentially what it's using as uh, our base image. So this is that from command. Um, I thought it was good to be a developer and add comments in there, so people are not confused, right? Well, we get paid by the hour. You're you're starting to start to At least sitting right there, yeah, I'd have moved you guys off to this. Um, and again, you see, we talked about the you know think about the things we asked in the wizard. There was the Node version, and you know that we basically put the LTS branch inside of there. So the Docker file here is really simple, but. 
if you wanted to add additional uh, frameworks or additional uh, um, go and get additional command or um, additional uh, code frameworks or SDKs, you can use the Docker file to go ahead and do that and pull them in at the time you're creating this image. And that's where you can get to the point of being able to create whatever um, whatever it is you need to build out your application. Um, we were working with some uh, folks who were actually doing testing and they had certain test frameworks that they needed to bring in. Uh, and the reason they went down this path is so that not to, um, not to have to keep those things updated all the time. So bringing those in here and creating a base image that has everything they need anytime they start up a new project, that was, that made perfect sense for them. So they were, they were all um, uh, excited about going down this path and, and uh, using that for the development objects. Um, this also comes in handy when you think of, I don't know, how many people are Python developers? I know, it's a C sharp, yeah. <laughs> but you could be, right? Um, I had a, uh, but it would be, yes. That, I know. <laughs> so one of the things that, because um, we do a lot of different sessions with customers, one of the options for doing an Azure function is to use Python. And I don't have Python installed on my machine, but I could go down the same path of saying Visual Studio Code, new project, and say I want to create a new container, just like we did here. But if you do it with an empty folder, then it asks you, well, what language, just like we did here. But I could pick Python and say that I want to use a Python project. It would go and pick the latest Python image, bring that down, bring down, I could app get whatever kind of additional pieces I wanted inside of there. And now it's all isolated from my machine, which is really important. I'm sorry, keeping, are, you, yeah, sorry. are you coding inside the container or are you coding? Right now we're coding inside the container. Now, uh, the little, uh, Rob just pointed out, the green left at the bottom of the, yeah, Sorry, not the. I don't want to do Thank you. There you go. So, yeah, that little thing on the bottom left, that indicates your. Yeah. You don't see. Go for it. Like, Windows isn't necessarily saying, hey, you're in a container right now. It's not like you don't have to click on the taskbar. Container. Right. It's just sort of hidden from you, from you, so to speak, right? But, but VS Code knows it's running in the container. Right. VS Code knows it's running in the container, yes. And when the dev container.json file got created, Visual Studio Code asked me and said, Do you want to reload this in a container? Right. And that was my option. But it knows how to look into the file system inside yeah. the container. Right. So going back to that specification document, yeah. Applications that are aware of the dev container.json know where to look for it. If it sees it there, it will ask. Yeah. So the question doesn't do an inline install of FSL two. Good question. So to run this, um, it, this right now is not relying on WSL two. Oh. It's relying on. Everybody knows that WSL two stands for Windows Subsystem on Linux. Uh, weird. <laughs> I know it stands for weird, strange, Blue. labor. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. A great question. And so, yeah, so in order to get this to run and do the container. Yeah, didn't I? Okay. The question was, is it using. Do an inline install of WSL, Windows subsystem for Linux. Yeah. So it doesn't do an install of WSL2 or Windows subsystem for Linux. No, it does not. What if I, what I'm running under the covers here is an instance of Docker. So I had, that's my containerization engine. So we need, when we talked about containers, one thing we didn't mention was you need some engine for those to run. And Docker in this case is what I'm using. Um, if I don't have that running, it will prompt you and say, do you want to, it's not running, do you want to retry? And I'll spin it up. Um, okay. Cool. Um, I'm sorry, you had a question in the back. Yes, <laughs> I knew it was weird. Great question, great question. So if you close this down and reopen it, what happens with the, the user experience? I'm just going to close this. And um, thank you. <laughs> what happens is, if you look here, we actually have two entries. We have an entry here for 
the original folder that we opened. And then we have another one here, which is the same folder, but running in, uh, running in my uh, container. So I have the option to pick up whichever one. Let's say, let's say I just do this and I grab, um, Location. Because that, because the um, the folder is mounted, essentially, oh, it's, the same. it's the same same folder. So you you modify the same set of files. Um, if I click this one, again, VS Code recognizes it and says, "Hey, this is a container." I've had that happen where it's, and it doesn't look, I guess because I, phys, or I chose that one over the other, but I have had it come back and say, yes, you open this folder. Do you want to open it in a, open this in a container? That is one way to get there too. So we could do this there and say, actually, there's nothing, um, how I would typically do it is do the control shift P get to the containers and say reopen a container here. Oh, okay. And then it prompts me to say, is this what you want to do? So I'll say yes. Yes, yeah. And that green bar at the bottom, we talked about remote development and we talked about there being containers, SSH and WSL. Wherever it is that you are remoting into, you're going to see that information uh, in that lower right-hand corner, left-hand corner, sorry. Great question. Oh, yes, so can the container be in the cloud? Um, I'll get there. <laughs> um, yes, it can. So I don't know that we're going to have time to show it all completely, but one of the possible mechanisms is um, I can post the link to it to show, but there's a, you can basically do and it took me a while to get my head wrapped around this a bit of inception. So you can actually take a container and have it running on a Linux box, a Linux VM in the cloud. And what you can also do then is do a remote SSH connection to that virtual machine. And then once you're on that SSH connection, reopen that folder where your code exists inside of a container. So it becomes an SSH session to the machine, and then once you're on the machine, it's a container that you're opening up and running into inside inside of that machine. So, yeah, it was a bit of inception kind of thing happening. So, um, it took it took a while for me to get that straight, but it is awesome when it works, um, and it does work. By the way, it's it is awesome. I should just leave it at that. Um, what I will do here though is because um, I want to show one more thing before. We roll out of this and we face that. Um, okay, let's do this. So I have my code. Let's go ahead and uh, .NET new git ignore. Let's see if we can do this in the next 10 minutes so we can get Nick up here. Uh, so all I did was I created a git ignore. And the reason I did that is because I don't want to package up all of the all of the folders and files that are inside of this project. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a git init. And um, there's me, do a repo. Plates, we're just going to say, yep, it's me. Fine. Anything else? You already got that. Boom. So all I'm doing is I'm creating a repository in my GitHub uh, account, and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to go ahead and now do um, pushing an existing. Let's do that. Um, paste. That's why I paste anyway. Cool. So all it did was it said, I have this local Git repository, create an origin, uh, reference to the origin up in uh, the, my GitHub uh, repo that I just created, create a branch, push that branch up to, up to me. So now, if I go back to here and reset, uh, 
Oh, thank you. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Main does not match any. Oh, um. Branch. Oh, let's see. Uh, get status. Oh, okay. They're untracked. Good point on the get ad, whoever said that. So you're adding value, too. That's it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right, we did a get ad. We'll do a get commit. The thing is, I'm so blind, I, I'm like, I'm really trying to look. <laughs> um, Shield. It's late. It's been a long day. Sorry. If this was a spelling class, this would be important. <laughs> <laughs> and then get push you uh, or domain. All right. Don't do this at home because you should have a branch protection on your main branch so you don't do. Stupid stuff like that. All right. Now we can go back and we can see that we've got code here. We've got our dev container file. And if you go into this repo, I think it's public. All right. So anybody can go to this repo and you can do the same thing I'm doing, which is it says, hey, we've got a code space. And we're going to create a code space on our main project. <laughs> so anybody can do this. Any, anybody can do this. Um, uh, I'm gonna have to. I forget if it's for, uh, what the cost is on it. I'm sure there is a. Sorry. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> No, it should say. <laughs> I, I will leave that there. Um, so it's still connecting. Any questions as we go through this, as we'll wait for this code? Yes. Yep. So yeah, so it will. Exactly. So, exactly. Much like we, we had code and um, Visual Studio Code understood what that dev container file did, and it created a container and put my code inside of there, GitHub is doing the same thing. It's taking that code that lives in that repository and moves it over. So if we were to make changes locally and push those up and then open the code spaces from there, those changes would be visible. Now, if I make changes here, they won't, right? Because it's already in the container and it's already put aside. Um, but what's cool is I can also, it is VS code in the browser, which we're now going to go ahead and debug. And Oh, uh, this is, yeah. So that error will happen. Um, I think it gives me the, on Wednesdays, yeah. Um, why, did I, why did my IoT tools come up? All right. So this is related to a certificate, all right, this line here, because we're running in Linux. When you run locally, you can do that self-signed certificate thing. There's, uh, um, there's instructions there to go ahead and do that and put that certificate in place, basically. Um, yes. Matter of trust, yes. Um, okay. Anything? I see any, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Oh, I know. 
Um, so we talked about extensions and extensions, and this is where you have to keep your you keep your head straight about where you are. If I have those list of extensions that were running inside of Visual Studio Code that we saw that had the remote development, the SSH, the development, the WSL development, those were all on VS Code in my machine. So if I look here inside of this container, I don't have any extensions installed related to that, right? The browser has installed our remote development one so that we can go ahead and do code spaces. But let's say I wanted to bring in, um, uh, can I do this? Yeah, this. All right, C sharp. That's fine. So it's going to go ahead and reload our code space with that extension inside of there. Um, it'll take a few seconds. It should take less time than it did before because it already has the uh, the image bits that it needs. Uh, inside of here now should be. I'm sorry, extensions for? Oh, regular studio. Hold that thought. We'll talk about that in a second. OK. Yeah, so, sorry, Nick. It's OK. OK. Uh, so the question is around Visual Studio. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, let's see if I wanted to put a, I think we another extension. Um, best. There we go. Let's do this. Uh, Let's say I wanted to install this extension here called REST API, right? Um, running a new version, it's fine. Don't worry about it. What I did was I installed it here inside of this instance inside of my container. I'm pretty sure if I go back to this program, no, nope, this dev container, come on. I don't have that extension listed here. So all I've done is I've taken Visual Studio Code and said, I want this extension, go ahead and bring it into my container. Well, that's not going to help the next person who comes along because that dev container.json has not changed. The next person who goes and gets this out of my environment is going to get it without that extension included. If I go back to my extensions and say, add to dev container, you see I now have this, insta or this extension here, and now it's updated for everybody who wants to check this code back in. Okay? So it's important to keep that in mind where you are, where you're adding the extensions. If you don't see it, then uh, check inside of that dev. Uh, if you're inside of the container and don't see it, it's probably out at your host version of VS Code and be able to get it as you go inside of there. Questions, comments? Andy. Earlier you were talking about uh, a YouTube show or something. That sounded pretty interesting. <laughs> 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 what was it uh, we'll hold that thought. Um, okay. Does this sound cool? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Come on, you guys are live audience, right? Yeah. Awesome. I want to show one more thing, and, and thank you, sir, for reminding me about uh, this other recent announcement that came out. Um, uh, bring this up here. There were, i find the right one. Um, ba -ba -ba. There we go. So there is the ability to do dev containers in Visual Studio now for Visual uh, for use for C++. Um, so this is one of the um, because of the I don't know all of the underworkings of it, but this particular. Um, you, doing C++ projects, you need to be inside of Visual Studio. So, uh, or you can't. I'm sorry, you can do Visual Studio Code as well. You can't. You shouldn't. There's there's warnings in there about having both pointing to the same uh, container information. But essentially, this gives you the ability to do what we just did with C++ inside of Visual Studio. So, I would definitely say go check that out. That just came out in the last week. Um, can I ask just a question? Yeah. What is C++? 
That's a different user group. Repeat the question. So, yeah, repeat the question. Right. Sorry, sorry. That was a hackle. That's a hackle. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Mel, edit point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, it does work. It works quite nicely. Um, Thank you. <laughs>